Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Engineers Ireland. Uh, my name is Brian Clear, so I represent the PM Society, uh, promoting um, project management within the engineering field. Um, tonight, as you can see there, our lecture is uh, by John McGrath, and you can see there from the um, slide, his profile is, um, is, is, I would say, very impressive. Everything from um, student union uh, welfare officer up to uh, working for the United Nations World Bank. So um, John has certainly um, got uh, a, a pretty wide range of experience. And John's going to talk about project management excellence this evening. Um, and it's going to be for about an hour, and um, he'll take questions uh, as you see fit, OK? So um, hope you enjoy it, and good luck to John. OK, guys. OK, uh, so uh, in terms of my own background, as uh, Brian said, I've been involved in PM for really over 20 years. So um, essentially, because I worked for so many organisations, I think I've had a lot of feedback from the companies that I've worked with. In terms of developing PM excellence, unfortunately, it's a bit like wearing children. There is no perfect diet. actually learning to roll with it and to adapt. So that's the kind of biggest thing that you have to consider when you talk about PM excellence. What is best practice in one organisation is very often not at all suitable. We're finding that more and more now where some organisations say that Agile works extremely well, other organisations say that Agile is disruptive and it doesn't help. Other organisations don't do either and they develop their own hybrid model. So I think that's a very important encounter and that's a, how we have evolved. Just to think in terms of how PM has evolved, the, the, I suppose the, the big factor I always think in terms of how project management has matured over the last 20 years is the whole Y2K function. So if you can remember back when Y2K happened, there was no project directors then, very few organisations had a DMO, really PM still belonged to the military, heavy engineering and construction. But what Y2K did was it really forced organisations to speak the language of project management started talking about the need for risk management, contingency planning, and really I think where that changed for all organizations is that they, they reflected on the need to have a pro professional project manager. So I think that has, so if you think about that, it's only 17 years ago, so in terms of how we've come from then, if you take alone the, the emergence of Agile over the last 10 years, and what has happened, there's been kind of huge uh, transformational change in the PM space. I suppose really what we could say is that organizations now recognize project management as a strategic competence. They see it that it gives a solid return on investment, whether you're supplying customers or supplying citizens. So that's a quite a dramatic change in ter terms of where we come from. Other thing that we're noticing is that more and more organizations are adopting PM principles. Since our own Irish government last December introduced the Project Management Handbook for the Civil Service. So this is only out since last December launched in Dublin Castle, and where we often talk about PM being technical skills, it's very interesting, the very first paragraph in this document, it actually defines the project management, the arts and skills of project management is now a core competency for all managers. So that's hugely important. PM is no longer a specialised field, it's a requirement for any manager to understand PM. It's the nature of how we work. More and more we're seeing project-based organisations, and that requires all managers at all levels to have PM skills. One of the biggest challenges we have around that is the area of project sponsorship. Organisations, professional bodies, they're all very good at coaching and mentoring project managers and project teams. One area we tend to neglect is the whole area of project sponsor development. Very often project sponsors are landed in the role of a project sponsor with zero project management experience. And essentially, if you think about the sponsor, their role is ultimately about creating, I suppose, the workarounds when you hit a roadblock. They are supposed to be that strategic input in communicating to their senior leadership team, but very often they actually don't understand the basic concepts of PM. Research then also indicates that the senior leadership support or the project sponsor is always attributed to the top three causes of project management success or failure. So that's a kind of a big area. If we really want to develop PM excellence, I think that's the kind of weakest link in most organizations is senior leadership support and the emergence of the project sponsor. The other thing that's happening more and more is there are more jobs than ever before in project management. So global research from PMI will indicate that there is going to be 1.5 million new jobs every year for the next 10 years. So that's 15 million jobs. It's a hell of an opportunity. But 
issue is even with practical female results, there isn't enough skilled and qualified people for the roles that are actually there at the moment. So we're actually seeing in most uh, sectors at the moment, people talk about a labour abundance in lots of areas and in lots of tough countries, <coughs> but when it comes to PM, we have a talent shortage. That's a massive issue that has to be addressed <coughs> for organisations that do become more cyclical. I also think in terms of Brexit, in terms of what's happening, so the PMI had the conference last week, today last week, and there's a huge discussion around the whole area of Brexit. It's going to be huge opportunities, but the issue is, again, is this talent shortage in the field. Um, I also think as well in the whole area of medical devices, pharma, huge amount of US multinational companies we have here, in terms of what happens with foreign direct investment in Ireland, there's going to be a major need for organisations to adapt and evolve, <coughs> and probably those sectors that to some extent have been cocooned a little bit from the financial crisis, I think that there's this challenging times ahead for those organisations. Ultimately, it will be about their ability to respond and adapt that will actually define which organisation they be. Other things we're finding is the traditional view of, of time, cost and scope. So 10 years ago, 15 years, years ago, everyone accepted if you delivered on time to budget to scope, your project was a success. That is still really important but it's simply no, not, no longer enough. And for complex projects, it just doesn't work at all. So what we're finding now is in the new era, at the very least, you have to be able to deliver the technical or the functional specifications. That's extremely important. Your project managers now are expected to be business savvy. They need to understand things like return on investment, how benefits realization is calculated, and more and more we're seeing the issue around stakeholders. It's very interesting to hear about this uh, new hospital that's being launched. We're actually seeing at the final stages, and we're actually going to try and start executing. We're actually finding the importance of stakeholder engagement and how it can dissuade a project at any stage. So, really, if you think about it, the fundamental time, cost, and scope, which you often start with the technical, the hard skills at the end, are still really important, but you have to deliver to this level. And in fact, if you think about it, in terms of the skills we need, the traditional technical skills, the traditional PM skills, I would take the view it's no longer enough. So about 12 months ago, I sat down with um, about 10 different people with a huge amount of project management experience, and I looked to map out what the best practice skills were. Um, and some people came to me and said, well, Dara, one thing I didn't say to you is, uh, this is uh, a second home for me. I've been in two things for engineering Ireland uh, over 20 years, uh, working as a consultant, uh, and I've worked for a lot of engineering uh, companies who are members of engineering Ireland. So it was actually a mix of people from all different sectors, but this is essentially what we re agreed was best practice in project management, that you had to have the technical skills, we talk about the likes of Finlock. Now I'll explore that a little bit more, it's been widely referenced document in engineering projects. Uh, you also need to have an understanding of agile. So it's good to know almost what we consider to be the opposite, but in many respects, I actually think they complement each other. One thing that always amazes me is people talk about the new uh, methodologies of agile. Personally, I think construction people were running agile projects 20, 30 years ago. In agile software development, we talk about stand-up heating. To me, as I look at it, and a stand-up heating is no different to a toolbox talk that was happening 20, 30 years ago. People were deciding what are we going to do for the day ahead. So in many respects, it isn't really that the methodologies or the frameworks are competing with each other. In many respects, they're all focused on the same thing, which is delivering a successful project outcome. Project planning system is a huge issue, I think. More and more we're seeing the need for every, the holy grail of PM is people talk about strategic alignment. The bottom line is you can never have strategic alignment without first getting visibility. If you, and no matter how complex it is, it can be done. So for example, uh, two weeks ago I was over in the UK and I met uh, somebody from the PMO in Honeywell and they had a uh, uh, print, they had over 30 different IT systems and they actually narrowed it down so their PMO actually really became a change agent and essentially what they now have is they have five IT systems and their enterprise PMO system was actually driving a lot of the other, they still have their finance system etc but it's actually taken over. The level of visibility they have, they actually have visibility of 35,000 projects globally through their enterprise PMO. So, and they started with zero visibility with Excel spreadsheets, which a lot of us do. So it can be 
without compromising quality. And the second issue was uh, across the project pipeline of Turkey projects, what was the visibility of the resource to be acquired? So those were our key, key remit. A lot of people talk about that you can have planning can evolve. I certainly think part of planning is you, rea you react, but I also think there is no substitute for upfront in-depth planning. That was the challenge we had, and this is the unwanted full visibility of every single deliverable across 30 different projects. Now, while I talked about the importance of technology, my own, I'm a big fan, I think that the best planning tools of all is the good old-fashioned whiteboard. And I think that's a new challenge for project teams. We still heavily communicate or over-communicate by email. I think sometimes you have to leave the technology at the door and actually go in and capture that knowledge that's in the room. This is an actual slide that was taken here. If you can see here, this date gone, this isn't something that I found on Google or anything like that, this is the real deal. So you'll see here, we looked at how we would go about it, or order factory acceptance test, delivery to site, install, equipment commissioning, process commissioning, and you can see us trying to establish the dependencies across the entire program of work. This is the first time we had a coherent visibility on how one in a hundred it possibly what we actually did is we took this then to the non the non-technology, not using a PM system, and we actually established uh, a template on how we could deliver this. You'll actually see we have the different screens that are captured. That's one of the pieces of equipment, tablet folder. And we're actually looking at how we would deliver it. You can see that there's a, a huge amount of deliverables all happening at the same time, huge pressure on resources, hence the need for key visibility. When we actually developed it out into a full Gantt chart, establish the full resource demand. It's hard to see here. These are all the different departments. We've established all the dependencies. That's just on an individual project. When we took it to the next level after we understood what we had to deliver in terms of our resources, what we actually found was this is the breakdown of hours across the site on a single site. When we rolled that up to a collective view of the 30 projects, we could actually see we're looking at a deliverable of 240,000 people hours over 18 months. The clear at that stage, there is not a hope in hell of delivering this project. We could see failure after 16 minutes, 16 months, very clearly. Almost like a car crash in the distance, we could see as the equipment came in, no resources, no resources, no resources. And I think this is this is why our planning, you know, when we talk about agile, to some respects, planning has gone out of fashion. I think we've still got a plan, but we've got to adapt the plan, maybe in terms of being more adaptive than we could deliver quickly. But the big issue here that I think, and this is part of, of project success, is that you plan for failure. You establish what failure looks like well in advance, and then you can do something about it. So we were proactive, and what we did establish in this is that there was a project disaster ahead. So we could see after six weeks, we could see exactly what was going wrong. One of the pressures we're all under as project managers is the requirement to deal with senior management teams who say it still has to still have to deliver. When you look for new resources, they say you haven't got it, but you still have to deliver. The difference was we could put a business case and we could actually establish very clearly that this project didn't be delivered. So essentially, we put the ball back in management's court and we actually essentially went through the essence of identifying the problem, delivering the work in 18 months. We analyzed it and we could see what we needed at 240 people hours and we actually put it back to management senior leadership team in order to see how we're going to deliver. This project was deemed to be of such strategic importance, we're actually given a blank budget to deliver. So what we did is we resourced up very heavily. The senior leadership team in the organization, I thought were very smart, very strategic. They recognized the importance of the project. They recognized this is a one in a, one in a lifetime opportunity where you have an unlimited bu budget in a project. Typically what happens in these type of environments is we bring in the contractor and they work side by side with the existing staff or they move off and so project goes. So what happens is the new equipment could have been uh, installed by the uh, contractors. But the problem is when the equipment is installed, the contractors leave and all the knowledge leaves with them as well. What was quite smart in this is they resourced up very early. They brought in the contractors to work side by side with the existing staff. As the equipment arrived in site, full-time staff walked off, walked off the job into a project role, installed the equipment, and then went back into a business as usual. 
It was also an ideal way to have a uh, talent there to be recruited in the larger expansion school. If we look at this project, in terms of the 10 knowledge areas, if I was to limit that to five, I would say it was a massive undertaking to schedule that. The cost was irrelevant. There was no budget there. The budget was totally blown. Massive undertaking in scope to establish what exactly it had to be delivered. In terms of quality, it still met FDA requirements, etc. And a full understanding of risk. In this case, the risk really was to schedule and to resource the time. So I limited it to five because you make everything important, nothing is important. But that's an example really of I mean project management excellence. I think it's unique to the situation that the organization is in. Let's take a look at a different one. This is one here where I was involved in setting up the CMO with the ESC. We all know ESC is a very large organization, and this particular uh, part of the ESC is quite small. It's telecom services. It's about 200 staff. Uh, they work on the, on the critical path in terms of power station development, but they're really a small cog on a big wheel, and always at the end of the project, they're always on the critical path. Their remit here was really to set up a, a CMO and to establish best practice and to ensure that all the project teams around the country are going to develop. This is quite an interesting CMO because it's a very small level CMO in a large organization. Sometimes in large organizations it happens that the, it takes up to seven years for a CMO to deliver a return on investment. This is the opposite of that, it's a small agile CMO with only two full-time staff. What was interesting on this is, was the organization was very honest about in terms of where they were and where they needed to get to. So they actually recognized at the time they had no overview requirements, no master schedule for what they had to deliver, and as a result of that, there was insufficient data for decision making, and they had no ability to compare plans versus actual, which is the essence of CM really, and know what risk analysis to assess from risk. A lot, I've actually used that slide in a lot of organizations where I actually say, how, where are you in terms of this? Because this is often where your current state is, and what establishes where you need it to get to in smaller milestones as you progress. A typical organization doesn't use a CMO tool, using Excel as a CM uh, reporting tool, uh, square peg in a round hole, I think it's a very different way of doing it. As a result of that, limits in al allocation of reporting, silo approach, no visibility of milestones, and very much reactive uh, planning and email as the only communication tool. I think a lot of organizations are probably at least consistent in terms of that. It always amazes me how organizations have matured in many disciplines. If you think about how recent social media is, and in terms of the different campaigns, the investment that organizations have put into it, but in terms of the project portfolio management space, I think organizations have been slow to invest. That is changing because organizations now recognize that all strategic change happens through budget. Some organizations still like to call it innovation or continuous improvement, but when you remove the wrapping paper, there is always a project that goes much more underneath. This is the position that these guys were in. In terms then, what we originally focused on was that it should be about two a consensus of bringing the CMO would go out and tell the different project teams the best way of doing things. It turned out to be something totally different. It turned out to be a massive knowledge transfer knowledge transfer exercise, and a lot of that was around developing pipeline visibility, which is a huge challenge for organizations. In terms of how we went about, again, we decided what was best practice, and we actually gave this template out to the different project teams, and we gave them strict instructions, you have to follow the template. After about four weeks, what did people realize? Nobody was following the template. A typical CMO in this situation becomes the project team, tells people, you must, you should, you have to. What I thought was quite clever about this was the maturity of the management team, and when they looked at what people were doing, they put their hand up and said the project teams were actually doing a far better job in terms of there was innovations in their methodology. They are the people on the ground who were delivering successfully, and that went from graduate engineers up to uh, more senior members who were still out there essentially on their tools at that stage. So what we actually did is we changed the whole focus of the CMO and we made it really a knowledge transfer exercise. And what we did is we actually went around the country, we literally called it the CMO Roadshow, and we went around to all the different project teams and we got them to rip our templates apart and we got their ideas. So I actually call that a knowledge harvesting exercise. And 
anytime I'm involved in setting up a CMO team, that's when I've always found you can get a better bang for your buck quickly. First thing a CMO should do is go out and find all the good things that the crisis teams are doing, take them back into central off head office, CMO, and share that. So really what happens is you're becoming relevant straight away with the crisis team. <coughs> In terms, so the, the end result of that, we got to the stage where you can see all the different teams who are involved in this. By the way, I forgot to tell you, I'm not an engineer, but don't tell anybody, right? Okay, but in terms of, we could actually get visibility on what they were trying to achieve. In terms of this project, time and cost were both of that. They were not the driver at all, project success. It was really understanding scope and quality. In terms of, it became a massive exercise in communication, top down, bottom up, and I think that was actually really what made this project successful, was the open and honest dialogue between all different levels of the organisation. It also meant that when we met, everyone's opinion was equal, when you were a, a graduate engineer or you were a senior engineer, everybody had an input into the centre. So, in terms, I know there's some IT people here today, this is an IT project I worked on, in this one, I have to say, I really wasn't involved in the project management side of it. My role was strictly to uh, teach the end users on how to use the, the system. In terms of IT projects, does anyone know any of that? In terms of data stats or crisis stats?
trying to understand their business model and what it is they want to deliver. Essentially what they were doing is they were getting their stakeholders to be part of their project team very early in the process. It's a simple design process. Again, adopting some agile principles into it, this constant sense of feedback that has been brought into this. And very importantly, even after they said it was working, a couple of months later they brought them all back in and got constant feedback into it. So there's nothing overly complex from what they did. They planned it and they made sure they were resourced up to it. I think it's very important when we talk about all projects, but especially IT projects, delivering on time on budget and defining that to success. I would much rather see a project deliver late by 15% and cost by 10% and to deliver something that actually meant what was more meaningful than what was originally looked for. So I think that's part of maturity we need to recognize that success is different. It's okay to be late, it's okay to be over budget if you're delivering something better or more meaningful to the organization. I appreciate that's a challenge in engineering projects because we have very strict contracts done a lot of work in the area of forensic scheduling analysis and claims analysis to engineer, engineer Darling. But I think something the whole civils area can improve on is this almost kind of there's a sense of conflict between uh, uh, when it goes to conciliator or arbitrator, there's almost this, it's the opposite of what we're seeing in IT, the sense of partnership. Part of that I do think was due to the recession and margins are very tight. And as a lot of us know, that's really profits are coming from claims and not coming from I think hopefully we'll come back to improving in that respect and everyone will win again. The rule of thumb when anyone goes to court, nobody wins. We all know that. So I think that's a, a challenge that we have to endure as, as an organization. In terms of this project, the traditionals were irrelevant. It was a massive undertaking in quality. Ultimately, it was about fit for purpose. They understand the risk. The real risk was the users, the stakeholders. Delivering on time on budget if the users weren't happy would have been a disaster. Again, a massive exercise in people, communication, stakeholders. There is a theme starting to emerge. Project success is becoming more and more about the softer elements, the people elements, the need for leadership, the need for engagement, than it is about the technical skills. This is a very interesting project. This is Irish Rail. So uh, the project brief that they uh, gave me originally was this particular one here. So they wanted to build a project-based approach to infrastructure maintenance support by supported by a technology solution with SAT plan versus access. In a nutshell, what they wanted was visibility of railway maintenance. The track, the two pieces of steel, anything that kept that working efficiently and nothing else. I thought this was a simple project to deliver this. I thought it would take a couple of days. Guess how many bridges there are in Ireland? There's just must be some civil engineers who will make a stab at that. Now, before you answer and feel foolish, I would think in my head about 13 points. That's my initial thought. How many? 500? The only comfort factor I got is what did all the engineers say when I told them I'm not an engineer? Thank God, not another engineer. You don't need one. <laughs> they have plenty of engineers. My job is to get the engineers the technical knowledge into a workable document that we all could agree on. So I just fell in that. Now I gave uh, an estimation of, what did I say about 30 or something? Now what I actually found out, this is the reality of what we have delivered. We have 5,100 bridges. We have 15,000 physical assets. Each one has to have a plan and maintenance plan. I thought this was super simple. This is one of the most complex projects I ever worked on. We have 15,000 physical assets to deliver. We have 560 train journeys today in Ireland, believe it or not. Five minutes to go. I'm on the threshold. Now, this is the biggest problem. The only time they can work is between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning. At the time, they were spending 70 to 100 million per annum on railway maintenance. While this was being started in the background, 
the minister at the time, even if not just going in the campaign, but just trying to do the stuff that was doing there by I was saying uh, about two years ago, three years ago. But essentially at the time the minister was talking about the need to withdraw away the funding and budget for control that the pay be stopped. This was around two thousand eleven. So this was the discussion in the media at the time. In the background, this is what we were doing. We were actually trying to get visibility and trying to curtail it. And this is very important, I think. Some organisations still fail to classify what is a project. What I like about this is they recognise that a project is anything five to five hundred thousand. Anything above that is considered to be a capital project. Totally different methodology, managed using a totally different thing. So this is what we had to deliver. This was the challenge we had. The other thing as well is we had unplanned work that we had to consider. Far more common than you would think. Having all your resources utilised at 100% was as it wasn't that realistic. That wasn't a smart move to have, but we had to have efficiency, but not 100%. The other thing that I found is that in these type of environments, you everybody has a project that they want to deliver. Our biggest problem was we had all these different teams or divisions who were demanding work to be done. We had a massive work bank that we had to, would never have enough money or people to deliver. Essentially what we had to do is we had to prioritize projects. This is where our planning tool came in. Our criteria here was firstly safety. That was non-negotiable. Safety project that had to happen. And the second issue, because it is a commercial business, anything that slows down the speed of the track also has to be prioritised, otherwise, you're going to leave uh, customers to the road network. So, those were the challenges they had. So, it was very much safety driven, but it was also commercial. The other thing that I found is that the complexity behind this. So, this machine is an example of one of the uh, what that was giving us our, our work, contributing to our work bank. This machine here essentially goes along, x-rays the track, there's a lab inside, and this is showing us here a fault in the track which meets what you and I hear as a speed restriction on the track. So this was actually, this then ideally that work would be done at 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. that night, very often that was difficult, but that led to speed restriction, which in turn led to speed delay, and essentially the competitive advantage that the area had was steadily extending its value. So a lot of this was commercial decisions like everywhere else. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that you do need to see, I think, when you work in these type of environments, you need a visibility of, of dashboards. You need this is you know project management excellence and engineering, it has to be driven about firstly about keeping your people safe. So that was a very important metric. We constantly had all the time. And likewise we had an independent risk management module that looked at how risk was being dealt with with the people and in terms of all the different parts of the maintenance facility. This is a very interesting project, I think, and it, it shows good practice. This is a seven-span bridge. I'm always corrected in this. I call it the Cork to Dublin line, but the Dublin lads remind me it's the Dublin to Cork line. <laughs> but this particular project, we planned for nearly a year. I'm not saying we planned it full time, but it was on the horizon. So we planned it say, for a year. We executed it in less than five days. Very difficult project. You can imagine standards of access, listing all the things said, List all the steel track and put on new track, very difficult access, but that's what good project plan gives you. So, and um, I always think of this project uh, mm -hmm. when I recently I live in a housing estate and they put up two traffic lights and a little lump on the road to slow everyone down, and that took over three weeks to do. And I think about if we did plan those things correctly, we could probably deliver them in 48 hours. And I think that's the challenge that we all have in these types of projects. There is always room for improvement. We're hearing constantly about the need for continuous improvement. At the end, we can deliver on that. We can add that value to the organization. This is a massive challenge we had. The language of the railway is totally different to all other project management language. If you go in and talk about critical path, uh, uh, schedule variance, cost variance, typically these are terms aren't really recognized by the people who count most, the people on the ground doing the work. The language that they use is they talk about the division, the, the line, uh, the mile post. Can you see that? The terminology they use, some of this I still remember, SBRS, uh, structural bridge renewal, track bed renewal. So this is the language they use. This is where they spend their money again. This is the important stuff. So projects of success, and this was very much driven by cost, will gain visibility of these challenges. 
Now, what we actually got in the end, so this gives you an idea here, this is a real figure, this is a real metric. You can actually see here, as we were improving our planning, we got the budget down dramatically under the 70 million. We're spending 12.3 million here in Athlone. This is how the country's broken down. 17 and a half million in Dublin, 15.6 million out of Limerick Junction. So we actually had brought it down in terms of the level of visibility. If I look at that 17 and a half million, and I drill into it, you can see the 17 and a half million, very importantly, we have tailored, we've taken an off the shelf project management tool and we have customized it. And you can see all the different codes. And what's very interesting is the engineers came in with this report, the finance people came in with the report from SAP, and by the second meeting, we had all the money aligned, right down to the cent from the spending million. So that was a massive undertaking. Going through finances used to take four hours. When I left them, they were doing it in 30 minutes, and I believe they have it now down to about 15 minutes. And they have it to the tee. One time we had a visit from um, the European Commission, and they happened to come and look at this, and they actually said that some of the largest railways in, in the world, or in Europe, even in Germany, they don't have the level of visibility that we have here. So you can actually see here, if I look here, we have a, a it's very hard for you guys perhaps to see, or maybe not when I'm this close, but I can see here I have a planned spend of 500,000. I can see I have an actual spend of 540,000. So that's flagged instantly. The project manager knows this in advance because they have a good planner who's supporting them. And they're actually saying you're 40 grand out. You're going to have to explain where that money has gone for the next week. There's no one wandering around making phone calls. Where has it gone? Everyone comes into the meeting. They have to have the answer to be able to establish it. In terms of this project, it was all about cost. Schedule was irrelevant. We had plenty of time to schedule. The issue was we didn't have the money, so we had to spend it efficiently. Scope was very important to understand what we deliver. Quality, I've actually removed that, and I would say safety. That's really what was important. And I think sometimes that's where the tin box and talk about the 10 knowledge areas. I think in lots of projects, we can either substitute one of these and we can put in the safety aspect. It's very important. The other big challenge I think organisations have is trying to link project and strategy. It's not getting any easier. We, we know about it, but we're very poor at actually delivering it. If we actually take a look at the research, 42% of companies are not aligned behind their strategy. It actually gets worse. If we look at The Economist, only 9% of organisations are successful on strategic execution. This is a massive challenge. It's a huge opportunity you can gain an extra 5% to 9%, that can't be that hard. We'll have a massive return on investment to our organization, our shareholders, and to the community. I'm going to take a, uh, so I think how we need to do that is all organizations talk about that they want to foster innovation, that they want to drive change, and they want to support continuous improvement. But the real issue is, this is aspirational. Talk is cheap. Unless you put projects and program as a central pillar in that delivery, you will never do it. So I think that's the question we need to be asking the senior leadership team. When they come to us, when we get these briefings and we talk about the need for change, the real question we should ask, show us your strategic execution plan. How are you going to deliver on this? And typically, the answer is, well, we haven't considered that yet. And part of that challenge is, we've got to put project and program center stage in what we do here. Very briefly, just touching this, these are two very interesting projects I worked on. So I was a planner for the uh, London and for the Rio Olympic Games, for the Paralympics. And at the same time when this was going on, uh, I was working for the UN for the largest uh, uh, climate change secretariat, essentially it's tracking uh, carbon credits, and I was the only external on setting up their PMO there. Uh, so I was based in Germany for this one here. I think this is a, a, a very simple lesson learned. Every organization, when you look at their mission statement or their strategic plan, typically what they have, they talk about their goal. I read recently that Amazon's uh, goal is to be the most customer-centric organization in the world. Wonderful aspiration. The real question is, tell me how you're going to deliver on that. So if we take a look here, when I work for Paralympics, these are what they wanted to do. Really good, quality, aspirational, value-added goals. They wanted to have a better Paralympic Games. They wanted to support athlete development. Massive issue in the Paralympics <coughs> in the developed world because richer companies can give better technology to athletes in the developed world. In the, in the developing world, they're using older technology. That's a massive implications uh, for the Paralympics. 
technology is a competitive advantage for them. So they had all these different goals, and also part of this was we have to raise funding from corporates. So if I take a look at this, I'll just move quickly to this. The first goal here, strategic goal, was the successful Paralympic Games. They typically had sub-objectives like most uh, organizations can does. But I'm just going to move forward here just for a sec. And this, I think, is the ultimate thing. When an organization talks about a strategic plan or what they aspire, the gap from where we are to where we want to get to, and remember, your future organization is the projects you're doing now. That's where your organization is heading. So if you want to, that gap is to get to where you are now, to where you aspire to get, Unless you have a program of work of supporting that, it isn't going to happen. If anything, you will slip behind because your competitors will be taking that execution journey and you will slip behind. One of the fundamental questions I always ask senior leadership is, these are absolutely fabulous ideas and you should be commended for it. Now tell me, how are you going to deliver? Show me the project against each one of these aspirational goals. Otherwise, we should scrap it and accept it's never going to happen. That's a big challenge. If you have any strategic, the question is, show me the project. Because this is theory, this is practice. This is aspirational, this is execution. And that's what we need to do as PMs. We need to take the right place, which is as an advisor to senior leadership teams, and tell them that we will support you, we will assist you, but you've got to give us the funding, you've got to give us the resources to make that change that you're looking for in the organization. So in terms of the different knowledge areas, I think it's a, a snapshot, a very rough journey maybe to them, um, but I hope you've gotten a few takeaways in terms of that for you. So I'm very happy to take questions. Thanks very much. Good man. You've got a key learning there straight away. <laughs> John, how, how important do you think companies organizing culture to, to successfully deliver this package? Um, I think it's absolutely huge. Uh, yesterday I was in London and I came back and I bought a book. The only time I ever buy a book is at the airport and I usually get to read the first chapter and then I never read any more. But I remember buying a book yesterday and I actually will remember that engaged people, research indicates, deliver up to 400 times, I think 400% more than people who are disengaged. In fact, if you think about it, disengaged people are often a hindrance rather than a help. Sometimes there are people in all organizations, if they actually stayed at home, they would be the most successful contribution they could make to the organization. Isn't that true? culture is about that sense of belonging and um, I think it's really important. Uh, I think it's very difficult to get. I think very often we have been doing damage for years and there are some people I think that they haven't been treated fairly by organisations and it's very hard to get those people back on the bus performance. Uh, I think it's a huge issue uh, and I think it's very difficult. The other thing I have found with PMs, I have seen what I would call ruthless project managers and what they've actually done to people is they have damaged them. They've almost kind of forced them, bullied them <coughs> into delivering above and beyond the call of duty, not because they want to, because they were bullied into doing it. And those people, while the project might have been delivered, I always refer to that as the damage they leave behind, is those people will never commit to the organization and they will never work with that individual again. So it's almost that they have been um, emotionally uh, uh, drained <coughs> they actually almost have an hour resistance to do anything other than the minimum for the organization. So I think it works from both of us. As PMs, as all professionals, there's we both good, bad, and indifferent. We sometimes are very good people, but we do very foolish things. That's human nature. But I think getting that culture, and everyone talks about it, delivering on it, I think, is, is very hard. We talk about Google. Personally, I don't think bean bags are the way to go. I think it, it takes so much more. I think a lot of it is about communication, trust, open dialogue, and very importantly, rewarding people who do deliver. We have this kind of, a lot of organizations, it's about how long you're there, who you know, the internal politics, and that's how you get promoted. 
I think that's absolutely horrendous. It shows really weak senior leadership. And the simple reality is people will get up and go. If they're not promoted in an organization, they'll be exactly that. They'll get up and go to somewhere else. Uh, it is coming from the top, but I think one of the big things... That's at the top of the list, it shouldn't be anywhere else. Well, it's led from the top, <coughs> but I think even if change comes at the top, the nature of organisation structure, if you actually think about a typical organisation that still has this pyramid structure, that is about 150 years out of date, or at least that's when it was in vogue, industrial revolution, this command and conquer type approach. What we're learning now is we think about the example of the government project, is flatter organizations that are far more successful. And we almost have to kind of, you know, and I only had this conversation with a colleague of mine outside, and we talked about sometimes when you can't get a decision, you've got to make the decision yourself, and as long as you're acting for the right reason, you do it. You'll explain it afterwards. So some organizations, we have this paranoia where people won't make a decision, and they actually miss the opportunity. So I actually think that sort of requirement to get permission five levels up very often in a project environment, when you do that, you miss the opportunity. <coughs> you want the, the, the project uh, uh, leadership or the government team to make a decision. We're meeting in two weeks' time. Too late. The decision has to be made today. And I think part of that is we've got to empower people and trust people. As long as you're acting for the good of the project, the good of the organisation, even if you get it wrong, we will support you. I think so, but I think it's not just that. I actually think it's, you know, it, it's very easy to have all these away days and, you know, we talk the talk very well, but really, if you think about it, nothing changes when people actually go back. Um, there was one organisation I, I, I was reading about, and they have a structure that if you're unhappy with anything in it, no matter how hard you are, you could almost open a ticket, and when that person hasn't resolved that ticket in 48 hours, it gets escalated up. And it's kept there publicly. So it's almost like 360 degree feedback, and not only that, remuneration is on the basis of your peers get the vote and how much you deliver to the organization. So you can imagine that. But if you knew that your peers were going to determine part of your bonus or part of your salary, that would change everything. We would get this real team building, not superficial. Is that what they are using this? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was actually an Indian company that I had read about it. I'm not sure, I don't think it was Tata, but I think it was an Indian company. I remember actually reading about this. But I think that, that's an example where instantly you will get a change of mindset. A lot of organizations, I don't think senior leadership would go for that because their own performance would be terrible. That's the actual thing, too. Is it's often the way friendship is uh, pushed to the back of the society and civilization. Very often, Ireland. There are, but <coughs> situations whereby people felt uh, comfortable. Yes, but there are other extreme too where we've seen organisations, and uh, I know in manufacturing in American multinational companies where lots of things I, you know, I question. They have this superficial um, team, everyone counts. But I have seen them actually. I've seen people who they're very intelligent, who be promoted to director of engineering, for example, because they deliver. So uh, the, the the problem is. continuous improvement where innovation comes in and you know and I, that shouldn't be happening if we are doing these things in organizations. I think it's it's about the people, it's about the processes, it's about and to 
about the two main issues. But I think there's, there is no organization out there where there isn't room for improvement. But I have seen in different organizations, and you do have a change in senior leadership, very often the team can change very quickly. That those people have been wanting the opportunity to do execute the change in the organization. So I, I wouldn't lose faith in it, because if you, you know, if you were gonna say, you may give up, and I think we've gotta, we gotta fight the good fight and keep fighting. And that's why I think also it's very important to invest in your own talent development, because the simple reality is, if the opportunities don't come up within the organization, they'll come up somewhere else. And the one thing you don't do is get complacent, I would still try and relate a week or two when there's no return, because ultimately at some point, I think the opportunities do arise. And the other thing I found too is that if you get complacent, no, there's no such thing as a secure job anymore. And if things actually happen and you do, and, and you do have sort of a, you know, a, a pretty uh, dramatic sort of career change suddenly or, an opposite, or you lose your job, I think by keeping that, keeping that edge is how you actually will move to another organization. I think you saw that with a lot of engineers in the downturn, they uh, moved into other roles. And I remember talking to people actually on courses here and they said, if so much has happened in the last five years, if you got out of engineering your discipline and you went off doing something else, trying to get back in now would be very difficult. You have your skill set, your knowledge is a site where continuous improvement is well. Francis, any other words? So the idea really is that when we take on a new project, we should be doing the right project, where you know our project selection. We, you know, we try and select projects that fit the organisation, that fit our model. But the problem always is, you know, taking on the project, you've got to make sure you've got the resources, you've got both capacity and capability to deliver on. So the reality is, in lots of organisations, your PMO has no idea what the projects are actually happening on the ground. So you can't even begin to think about are we strategic or not. We don't even know what the organization is doing. So part of that is actually, firstly, we want to know what projects are happening and who's doing it. I don't support contracting of individuals. I don't think you get a return on investment of that. We don't need to be, you know, punching in hours. I think that's, you know, that's the manager's job, not the PMO. If you need a team of people to do five people, I expect you to have a reasonable understanding and I don't question you in how you manage those people. I just say, tell me what your guys are working on, and what we want to do is to make sure what you're doing fits into the pipeline. Big organizations, especially if you're based in a uh, multinational, you'll often find that there's some initiative happening in Ireland, and it's happening in another country as well, and the, the two private teams don't even know they're both looking at the same issue. So that's where kind of we talk about visibility. So obviously when you get visibility of those two projects, when they start communicating, you get synergy, and they'll achieve far more. Uh, with great difficulty, um, with senior leadership support, and it's a massive undertaking. Yeah, because we're fully aware of all the work we do, but that doesn't change that. Yeah. How does that change it? Well, they have massive senior leadership support. They put very significant money and resources into it, and, and essentially they went about that gathering in every division of the of the business and finding out, starting off with a list of what projects are you doing. So, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. So that's the first question you ask. That's always the question I ask if I ever get to meet with a, uh, the general manager or the, you know, the manufacturing manager, or wherever it is I take them. First question I ask is, do you know what projects are happening in your organization at the moment? And the answer is always, absolutely. And I say, can I see a list of them? Can I see the status of what he's doing? And they say, well, I couldn't give you that now. And what they really mean is I'd have to ring each department head and I'd ask what's going on. They'd get somebody else to cobble together a bit of an Excel spreadsheet. Everyone would put it together. Somebody would cut, copy, and paste and summarize it and we'd have a written mouthpiece of visual understanding. The difference is as projects are being updated in a PMO enterprise system, you get that visibility all the time. And there are lots of tools out there. There's Oracle and uh, uh, of Air, excellent vocational project, very good tool. Microsoft projects, we have Jira and Agile as well. There's loads of them out there. It's 
много документация, а резултатът са някакви вайбки, някакви вайби просто да са. Okay, everyone, yeah, so just on behalf of the Project Management Society, I'd like to thank John very much for his lecture this evening. Uh, it was certainly a very interesting and interactive presentation, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I'm glad to see that at least one of the projects you spoke about for cost was a factor. Um, just a few items of society business. Um, first of all, for anyone who isn't receiving the email notifications, just to li like to remind you to make sure that you tick the um, Project Management Society box on your Engineers Ireland profile. Um, secondly, we're having the Project Management Society AGM here on the 1st of June, I think that's six o'clock. So if anyone is interested in becoming a, a member, a committee member of the Project Management Society, we very much encourage you to come along. The only requirement is that you are a fully paid up member of Engineers Ireland to become a committee member. Uh, and last of all, just to invite you all to join us for some refreshments and finger food in the Cafe Clyde. Uh, once again, thanks very much to John for coming on this evening. Thank you.